just, um, just by way of getting started, um, your first introduction to the band and their music. I saw them in 1990 at the Kyber Pass in Philadelphia and uh, was shooting Super 8 footage at the time and then got a Hyatt video camera and started shooting uh, live concert footage with them and would start traveling with them and kind of jumping the van or going to different cities around the southeast uh, and shooting footage along the way. They eventually had me start directing some of their music videos and then I made a feature film documentary about them called The Slow Century while they were kind of, they knew that they were about to break up and so we were finishing a film in that like early DVD era where there weren't really DVDs with bands like them at the time, but we wanted to make something that would get into Tower Records and Barnes and Noble and Borders and all those places that existed at that window of time where a band like this could get documented. And Slow Century was probably the first time I saw a lot of the footage that, I mean, on, honestly, that anything, because I remember I would see the Cut Your Hair video all the time on MTV and I had seen them live a bunch of times and I saw little bits and bobs of things on MTV or what, you know, um, I think I probably saw Letterman or something like that, but I mean, Slow Century was a mind blower for me when I first saw it because there was just so many incredible videos, so many crazy like DIY sorts of things and just wild footage of them live and backstage and everything. And you know, it really changed my perception of them at the time. Peter? I mean, I was just like a 90s kid, so they were the band, they were like the best. And you know, I think I started with, I started in order. I mean, I was a huge Wowie Zowie fan, I kind of was a nerd for that one. I, I am curious how Alex pitched you on, on your parts and the film and how much he explained or didn't explain and as far as the multi-tiered aspect. I'm curious how, how he talked to you guys about it. We'd been given like a 45-page script that we, we were going to go shoot it up in Portland, up in uh, you know the top of California and all these different places. And I, I think that you know through the four years that we were trying to make this film, it had kind of been conduced into a, a, a smaller sector where we essentially for Range Life shot um, only a week and a half in the basement of Matador Records. Um, I think the week before the writer strike happened. Um, and so, uh, you know, we kind of had to consolidate all of these pages into that finite amount of time. Um, so, you know, I mean, it was, it was very interesting having to kind of do that, but, you know, I, we, we were very aware of the multi-formatted, uh, screenplay or the, 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 the movie, the documentary, the musical, everything, um, and you know, I had gone to rehearse. I went to the rehearsals of the uh, the musical. Nat was there for the uh, the museum experience and whatnot. But um, yeah, I mean, we were we were down to get crazy with the multi hyphenated project that is pavements. Honestly, doing a Q and A is so trippy because we did like five fake Q and As for the movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where I was like smoking a cigarette, pretending to be Walking Phoenix, and saying like, "I fucking hate this." Movie. <laughs> doing shit like that. So now we're doing it for real. But honestly, I, this is the first time I've seen it. I was, Al, I got to know Alex um, Ross Perry just reached out to me on Instagram. I was like, I know you're a fan of Pavement. Do you want to be in, you know, my fake biopic movie of Pavement? And I was like, Is this the real Alex Ross Perry? And then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, yeah, I think it was like a year and a half later or something that we did it. But it. I remember we were about to go shoot a scene and Alex goes, oh, we lost the location. Can we just do it like a table read? So then we did the whole thing like a table read. The whole thing was like weirdly, like being at a fun theater camp or something. We were all just goofing around and um, and it, it kind of, you know, there was something about, and then also weirdly like a theater camp where the band kept showing up, you know, while we were doing it. And, you know, we're all these huge fans of Pavement. So the whole thing was kind of a meta experience. And, and anytime you'd ask Alex, you know, it's in. A, he's kind of saying it jokingly in the movie. He's like, "I don't know if it's going to work," but he would say it every day. I don't know if it's going to work, guys. <laughs> you know, I I think actually watching it, I've seen it so many times, but this time I, I just you've I did, only actually seen it twice. Well, I've seen it twice. I I did I did realize that every you know the people in the musical, you guys, the band, nobody really knew what the whole movie was. They're all kind of walking through. I mean, it's amazing how the band shows up and they don't know, they don't really know what movie they're in. And yet it's so beautiful because it really is like when they get to the museum, Alex's whole thing was like, I'll, I'll never do like a sit down interview, never do like a talking heads thing. And they walk in and it becomes 
their interview. Well, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is that we sat down and Peter and I basically wrote up a list of who would actually be fun to do something like that and maybe we could find a screenwriter who could come up with something more holistic as opposed to a documentary. And Alex was the first name on our list. He said yes, so we didn't, never spoke to anybody else. And he came back to us and he goes, well, I want to do a documentary that's about a musical and a big budget Hollywood biopic and a museum. And don't worry, won't, we won't have to actually do any of these things. Cut to four years later, he actually did a museum that launched in New York and ran for weeks and got real press and real coverage. And he l put together and had all the songs arranged for and launched an actual musical with an actual opening that got a full profile on The New Yorker and this long form follow piece in the Paris Review and reviews in USA Today. I mean, it was appalling. And <laughs> all the press that you saw in that movie was actual press that came out about all of these projects because this was by far um, the most intricate and involved film with the largest budget I've ever worked on. Um, that's you know, fast, cheap, and good, pick two. Took five years to make, do the math. Well, several of you have touched upon it in a certain way and, and the balance between sincerity and, and comedy. There's so much comedy in the film and we, we heard it, all of us, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of laughter watching this film too, um, which is very welcome and I, I, I think it was, it's there in, in their aesthetic in some way, but it's, it's teased out. There's a lot of Alex's sense of humor in this film, of course comes through in a, in a big way, and it was, it was hitting me even, even more seeing it um, here tonight on, on the big screen. I'm gonna put Lance on the spot a little bit with this as, as someone who has uh, documented a lot of musicians, but also a lot of, uh, you, you've made comedies and, and, and done uh, comedian stand-up specials as well. Any, any grand theory about uh, interconnections with indie rock and, and comedy? Traveling with them, they had a lot of interest in comedy of the 1990s, they were listening to routines and they were going to see people perform in New York and in the Bay Area. Uh, we had VHS tapes of Mr. Show that we were watching and even projecting before they would go on stage during some dates. Uh, if there was like a video system at First Avenue in Minneapolis or wherever, we'd put on you know, VHS copies of, of what Bob Odenkirk and David Cross were up to, things like that. Um, so there was like a lot of interest that they had in comedy as like clever, smart people. There's a lot of uh, kind of literary people around them. There was the Minus Times and a bunch of writers, uh, David Berman among them, and Hunter Kennedy. And so they would kind of like write things and, and Berman would draw like cartoon images and those would be sometimes t-shirt designs for pavement. So they kind of were aware of like mining wordplay and, and John Ashbery type poetry, but also comedy that was going on in the world at that that era, and that definitely was like an important element for them. Very funny guys. Uh, is what do you think would have been lost if only the, the big Hollywood biopic had been created about pavement? Um, I think and just, yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I think everything, right? If it was just that, I think it would have been absurd. The film needs all the pieces to work um, because each one, if you really want to get into the gestalt of it all, it's. Each one represents kind of a different facet of the band, all being thrown against all of the beautiful footage that Lance and a few others had shot over the years that actually shows the band in their real element. So it's really about the juxtaposition of everything. You know, this, so Alex spent a lot of time doing months and months and months, I mean, almost a year's worth of pre-interviews with the band members because he's ultimately, uh, I think a screenwriter at heart and you know is a writer director. And it was really about getting into the heads of all of all of them so that he could build characters in his mind and build these different facets of things. And honestly, it's why we went to him in the first place because there was this notion of Stephen Malcolmus specifically seemed like a character that Alex would have invented for one of his movies if he didn't already exist. And mm. there's a lot of layers to that statement, but um, Alex isn't here to unpack that. Um, and there, there was this notion of, okay, they kept talking about certain brotherly dynamics and dynamics between, especially between Steven and uh, Spiral. And you, know, you, you see them in all of that incredible footage performing and doing it so incredibly and having a lot of fun making stuff and making create, creative things with each other when they're making the music videos and 
you know, all of the antics backstage and all of that, but there are certain things that just, there weren't cameras rolling, it's behind closed doors. And the single worst thing you could have done was have actors attempt to actually recreate the emotions of that. So we had actors recreate the emotions of that in the most Hollywood and um, on the nose way possible and the best way possible. And these guys did such an incredible job. And I think probably the most gonzo thing we did was play the biopic for the band without telling them that maybe that wasn't the movie. <laughs> and then forced them to do a Q and A and get reactions in real time, which basically caused the entire movie to almost completely unravel and fall apart. And they started asking me how to get out of the movie. Right yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was there was there was a. Text I was chain. sitting. I was sitting next to Malcolmus during it, and he was shaking because I think it was a. I'm I'm serious. He was he was so because I think as much as it was so funny for the audience, I think for him it's his life. So he was. But then, you know, they've all come around to... I mean, what was incredible was seeing them doing the actual Q&A that they all did together in New York at the New York Film Festival. And Malcolm was sitting on stage like, yeah, Alex... <laughs> Uh, I mean, he basically had this look on his face like, okay, now I get it, but also you're an asshole for putting me through that. And at the same time, this completely captures the dynamic of a lot of things that played out. So, like, once again, it has it had layers to it, and the film doesn't work without all, the, all those layers. And then I'm going to selfishly counter that and say that it should have been a full biopic because that would have given us more lines, more screen time. Um, I think that I speak for Nat and I that we want to be on screen probably the entire time that you're viewing a film. And, um, yeah, you know, so it would have been really nice to jump into Eyebold even more. But uh, what, uh, what scripted scenes that didn't get shot with the two of you been the most excited to have shot? Well, I think it would have been fun to, I mean, it was actually really fun going into a soundstage and recreating Lollapalooza. If we had been on an actual stage and getting, like, an entire audience throwing mud at us, that would have been a, a, a really, really fun experience. Yeah, I think doing more of those performances, they were so fun. And also <clears throat> that we had all their real instruments. I mean, all the things that we joke about in the movie are really exciting as an actor to get to do all the, you know. Yeah, because, I mean, it, honestly, you know, I, I play music. Nat is a world-renowned musician. Check him on tour right now <laughs> with Billy goddamn Eilish. Let's go. Um, but, um, I, we all learned the songs together and we we're really excited to play them. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it would have been f fun to jump on stage and get a little bit of the experience. At one point we were rehearsing and Alex was like, well, don't get too good because these guys don't practice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. One thing I was impressed by was how much the film balanced the kind of satire of the film biopic stuff, but also like just a genuine capturing of the band and sort of how much they mean to people. And so I was just wondering how you kind of manage that balance of being like the film within the film, the performances within it, and how you find that that kind of mix of earnest appreciation and sort of the satire detachment. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes kind of to what you guys are saying, which is you guys were fully committed to those performances and you love playing the, you know, the parts just as the people in the musical were fully committed. It, we made the museum, Alex researched that for eight months. Like, we treated it like a real museum. I think there was like true, then you know, like genuine earnestness and love for everything we were doing, even if it was, you know, within an absurd frame. And so the part of you that I think everybody that loves pavement, you know, they have that ironic, ironic detachment, but yet they're also really good. And then you also really feel something for them. And that's a hard thing to do because usually, with ironic music, you like tip over into some category that's a little more just ironic. And, and I, so, yeah, yeah I think the balance. idea was the same way that on their albums, when it seems like they're totally taking the piss and they're joking around and they're not taking it seriously, and then all of a sudden everything pulls together into laser focus and you get here the biggest hook on the record. That was the idea of what we were trying, what Robert Green, who really is brilliant and a brilliant filmmaker, and most of the films that he directs himself are kind of these balances of scripted and documentary um, weaving together where you don't know what's real and what's not real. And he, he really just did an artful job working with, you know, working with Alex and with everyone else, but to find that right balance that really found, followed kind of the tone and the ups and downs and the fall apart and the come together of an album like Wowie Zowie, which really was the prototype for the film. Uh, so the band has like so many great songs and like everybody has their favorites. 
was there any point where you guys tried to interject your influence on what songs were chosen for the film or how certain songs played out? No, I mean, I think, I think Robert Greene, who we just mentioned, he, he is like just a massive Pavement fan. I think we have 88 Pavement songs in this movie. So, and, and sometimes it's just the beginning of a song that we use as a transition. Sometimes it might be unrecognizable because it's just some like fucked up feedback part of a song. But there's, there's a, most of the tracks are there. Um, and so I think he knew it so well even when, like, there's, like, an interesting moment in the movie where they're doing that whole influence section where there's the weird, like, red thing being molded and then everything comes together and melts together and they're talking about all the bands. And then you come into, like, that early Pavement song called R.E.M. And, like, only, like, a total Pavement, extreme Pavement nerd would know to put that song right there to line up with, like, the section with influence. Like, I think Robert had such an understanding of what to do with the music that I, I never, I never questioned it. I only had a single request, which was that he put Western Homes over the closing credits because that was the closing song on Wowie Zowie. Right. And he, he was like, "Great idea," and that was it. 